Well, again, I'm uh, John Shribs, and I have um, been working in uh, several committees after my retirement from teaching six years ago. And so I'm on the uh, Groundwater Committee. I am uh, president of Petaluma Wetlands Alliance. And um, I'm also chair of, our, um, of the Tree Advisory Committee for the city, and also one of the leaders in the Relief uh, Petaluma, which is pl just planted trees out here. And so I'm pretty involved uh, for today. We're gonna talk about water and water in general and specifically because it is the limiting factor for us here in Petaluma, uh, for our city here, for our watershed, um, for our space, for our resources, water is our limiting factor for, for just about everything. And I'll be going over today on strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats, which is called a, a SWOT analysis. So as we go through things, I'll, I'll try to be a little more comprehensive covering all these things. Now, just as a reminder, I think we all have got taught the water cycle back in, in grade school, but just as a reminder, it's all about the sun energy coming in. And the sun energy, as it comes in, heats up the water of the ocean, especially the surface, which causes evaporation, and the water goes up in the atmosphere, and then it moves. And then with the global uh, turning of the globe, um, it sets up a pattern where all everything moves around the world and the water moves around the world in various ways in a very thin layer of only five miles high. And then it deposits, uh, precipitates down um, in various ways onto the land. And then it moves slowly, either quickly on surface down to the ocean, um, down to the lakes, get hold for a while, or goes into the soil and then goes into groundwater, which actually is the largest reservoir of water on, on our land surfaces. Is the, is the groundwater, water underground in our soils in all the cracks and crevices. And it's not a lake, but it's just cracks and crevices and we can pump it up. And then it takes up to 10,000 years to go from the mountaintop through all the land and out back to the ocean. Okay, so that's the water cycle. And it turns out that climate change has had a major impact. Um, over, I just saw this article, uh, over a million trees here in California have died this year from combination of drought. And when it's droughty, uh, the trees become susceptible to the native bark beetles. Um, so we've had major devastation throughout California for our trees because of our, just the, the last two years of drought. Okay, so that has to be dealt with and that can increase fires. And also an article in paper today talked about um, the ashes and the carbon that's falling off the trees onto the snow in the Sierras causing faster melting, which just complicates how water is arriving here and how it flows and potential flooding that might happen from a quick me quicker melt up in the hills. So instead of climate change, um, really we should be saying the words water cycle disruption or hydrologic cycle disruption. And that's the real problem, not just that the climate is changing. Like, gee, so what the climate, ah, it gets a little warmer, eh, who cares? But it's actually the disruption to the water cycle that is the major impact that's gonna be happening to us and it's already happening here right now here in California. Okay, the take home concepts for today. Uh, we live in a watershed that's, that's very independent. Uh, we're the only major city within this watershed and it's pretty confined. So locally we can work with it and deal with it ourselves, uh, but we also have to think globally. Issues around climate change, our water supply is being affected. We've had loss of wetlands uh, due to human activities. We're getting flooding now because of combinations of increasing rainstorms, uh, harder rainstorms, um, more water in less time. We also have longer droughts than we did before. We're losing biodiversity uh, within the populations because we're losing a lot of our vegetation and our habitats. We have population growth in our, especially moving toward our cities and the cities have been growing tremendously over the last hundred years. Uh, used to be 90% of the population was on the farms. Uh, growing the food, and now we have 90% of the population in the cities, and, and uh, um, so that, that's been a major change, as well as just total growth, there's also a shift. Our economy is considered number one, so money matters to everybody, and anything goes wrong now, it says, and, and our whole way we deal with our economy is shifting us toward tragedy of the commons, and so that's another issue that we need to deal with which is all tied together. Social justice issues around water. Who's got the water? Where does it go? Um, who's in the flood zones? And, it, and there's a huge amount of social just, justice issues involved. And they're all interrelated. All these things interacting with each other. And so we're leading 
So if there's some bad results are coming. If we don't do anything, uh, one of my sayings is chaos is coming. And part of that is the uh, conflicts that we currently have is who's in control. And another conflict that, that creates is, do you love me or respect me? And, and will you deal with me and work with me? Um, or are you gonna be um, selfish about what, what it is you're controlling? There's lots of solutions. And, uh, it, and again, I just saw another article today, we could actually reduce our electricity by 75% and still live a comfortable life here in the United States. So, and also for our water, we could reduce it down to half of what we're using now and still do most everything we're still doing right now if we just take care. But these are not gonna be simple solutions. We need cooperation, multiple efforts, and we've got to think global, but we have the opportunity to act local here. And I think Cool Cities came in and gave you that discussion of what many things we can do. Here's a map of our area. You can see the hills on both sides here going down and the water comes down off these hills. There's even hills up there separating us from Santa Rosa. It all comes flowing down and eventually it joins into the Petaluma River, which is actually a slough, not a formal river as rivers go because it's tidal. And so the water from the ocean tides comes all the way up. In fact, it comes all the way up to a bright about here is where the tides flow up to where the weir is on, on the river um, by Lynch Creek. And, but all the water does flow down also. And you can see that here's our city and you can see this white buildings. That's our industrial buildings, all pretty much along the freeway and along the river here. You can see the downtown area here. You can see that we have a lot of housing, not big buildings with white roofs, but a lot of smaller housing up here that we've done. You can see our water treatment plant here. You can see a 2,000 acre marsh here. It used to be 5,000 acres. It's down to 2,000 acres now because this, all this land here has been converted to agriculture, which used to be wetlands. And even some of the area in here was wetlands at one time, part of the marsh. Um, but it's still the largest saltwater estuary, natural habitat, largest in, in almost all of Northern California, even Canada. We have the, one of the pristine areas that are being studied by um, San Francisco Estuary Institute. But here's the channel of water coming in from, from the bay. And here's, uh, so you know, this is Sonoma coming in and it has similar situation with its um, wetlands all being uh, turned into agriculture in the past. Okay, so let's move on. That gives you an overview of what our area looks like. Here's the official line of our watershed. It shows you all the creeks that flow down into it. And notice that there's straight lines here. And we'll talk about a little bit about that and how much water channels there are as you get closer to the river and how the flow goes. So this watershed is very important to look at as, as a whole. Here's some of the geology. Um, just as a note, we have tremendous uh, change that's happened over time between tectonic plates. We have lots of fault lines running right through Petaluma, part of the Hayward uh, faults, um, lines that come up and through and which Hey, we're expecting another large earthquake sometime in the next 50 to 100 years, so we need to prepare for that. Uh, but the rocks are underneath the ground, are all, you can see these, these seams of rock layers that have been uh, uplifted and moved around. And so we have various layers, but they're pretty much grouped. We have three large groups of, of rocks that are quite different from each other uh, underground. And it shows you that the soils that we have here, this is all diversity of soils. So we have a very, we have a mishmash of geology and soils in our area. Here's what the river looked like way back when. A study was done by the San Francisco Estuary Institute, and this is a map that they were able to find from old time. And look at all these loops that the river had at one time. And uh, there was one captain that was proud he could actually navigate this at night because he used a, his, his watch. He had, he had a really nice fine watch, and he was able to time every single turn at every speed. And he was really proud. He was one of the, he could actually go up the whole river almost blind and make it. But a lot of ships got stuck in the mud. So what did they do? They straightened out the river. So this is what it did look like. This is what it looks like now from the satellite in a very similar pattern. And you can see down here how this loop right here was cut off, straightened out. There's another loop right here, cut off, straight off. There's another loop right here, cut off, straight off. There's a, a little bit here and then it straightened up. And there's some smaller loops that were all kind of changed here. So here all, here's a map of all those little loops up here in our area, right in the center of town. 
um, used to be shallow and, and would flood all the time and uh, uh, hard to get a boat up this way. So what they did is um, the uh, federal, they did have the federal government, the engineers, uh, army of engineers that came in and straightened a lot of this out. And then also we had some Chinese labor left over from the railroads. They came in and dug out this extra channel on McNear and filled it up so it was more boats and more docks could be made there, uh, made us the richest town in the US for about 10 years back in the 1800s. Um, and this is an overlay of the two showing you the change. So here's the old river is very fat at the beginning and it's very narrow now. It's all been diked and channelized all the way up with agriculture being put pretty much on both sides and then uh, straightened up. So it's very faster moving than it used to be. And so that changes the way things, water hydrology moves. And so the modeling has to be done based on the new river versus the old river. Okay, here's uh, maps of uh, wetlands. Here's original wetlands. All this green area in here was a wetland. You notice the creeks did not go to the river. This was a delta, which actually came down, would flood, and the creeks would all, all flow in here, and all the sediment would flow in here, not into our river. These are all the wetlands that have been removed by humans over the last 100 years, particularly in the last 50. And in the early 100 years ago, 150 years ago, um, a lot of agriculture came in and all these lands were, were diked and turned into agriculture down here, including this land right there. Um, so we've removed over half of our wetlands here. We've paved over paradise. And people don't realize that this entire east side of Petaluma was an entire wetlands. That's why it was developed late after the 1970s. The town was all over here. And after 1970s, developers came in, hey, let's take all these creeks, let's channelize them, make a straight line all the way to the river and and pave over everything. So that's causing us problems. Um, groundwater, uh, I'm on the groundwater sustainability advisory um, for our basin. And we have one of the best basins and water supplies for groundwater. You, uh, you see the colors up here, more density of wells up here where it's yellow and shows you the, that there's a different geology up here, which is a lot of agriculture is still up here using these wells. Um, so that's all a good thing. And we're in pretty good shape overall. And this is the official legal boundaries of the basin that's set by the uh, state of California. And now we're going through this whole process of regulating groundwater and we're going to be charging fees on groundwater to make sure that we model it, we, we watch it, we monitor it, we're, we're digging wells and monitoring more, um, looking at all sorts of ways, looking at groundwater and combining that with looking at water movement, flooding, and the city is, is really on top of it now, trying to figure out what are we gonna do in our basin to manage water, both from a groundwater point of view, from a flooding point of view, uh, managing fresh water, where we're gonna get it, how much development can we do? Uh, these are all very intense discussions going on within the general plan, um, discussions that are going on now for a 20 year future. This just shows you, this map over here shows you some creeks that are coming in, lots and lots of water is being moved in our watershed around. And particularly up here, there's a lot of creeks that come down here to the north end. And right up here, this is where the major flooding is happening, right around the Petaluma Creek. And it really should not be called a river. It should be called a slough. But we changed it so that the, we could have some dredging go on by the federal government. But they just told us, hey, we've done it for the last time. We now have to dredge and pay for it ourselves because um, the federal government is not going to pay for it anymore. And we're talking about five to $10 million every time we dredge uh, every four to 10 years. So that's another thing we're gonna have to deal with over time in the next 20 years is, is do we dredge? How much do we dredge? How often and who's gonna pay for it? How are we going to pay for it? Okay, this another uh, thing that with water is wildlife. Wildlife needs water. So wildlife follows water. So here's the major, here's these blue lines are a major slough river plus all our creeks. We have um, uh, Adobe Creek here. We also have a little bit of Washington Creek, a little bit in here. And then uh, Lynch Creek is a major one and Lee Chow Creek up north. And this goes up, uh, up in the hills, other areas in the whole, continuing the um, Petaluma Creek and its tributaries that are all coming down. So these are all traversed by wildlife, fox, deer. We've even had a bear once coming up Washington Creek that people saw a few years back. Uh, we have deer coming up and down. I know at uh, St. James Gardens, which is right here, I've seen deer in there all the time come in and, and munch our vegetables. Uh, we have deer at Schollenberger Park. I've seen them come in down in here. 
We have badgers that have come in and around here. We have red-legged frog that comes in here that, that moves in. So that deals with that landscape down in here. Um, we've seen deer tracks across the river. And so there's a lot of movement. And so water, vegetation, habitat movement, it's all tied together. And we need to look at the whole picture and everything together as we look toward the future. So main ideas. Uh, Paloma City is a, it, we have a small urban environment compared to like LA or San Fernando Valley where uh, I grew up in LA area. And, but we're inside a pretty nice, very large, robust watershed. We need to take care of it. Water is a limiting factor. It affects everything, our food, our shelter, our safety, our community, uh, climate change with water cycle disruption. And we're connect our groundwater, surface waters, our wetlands and sea level rise are all connected and interacting with each other. And we're all trying to study this right now, get a grip on it, see what we're gonna do about it. Solutions are many. Nature-based solutions are uh, more expensive up front, but longer term are more economic and more efficient, more resilient, more sustainable long-term. So we'll see a couple of those. And there's things we can do ourselves, removing lawns, planting native species, building habitats, corridors, changing the way we do diking in the marshlands, water catchment systems along our creeks um, and, and wherever we put a house near, near a creek, everything, putting in, uh, uh, slow the water down, catch it, slow it down, using um, catchment basins and rain, um, rain ponds and rain landscaping or the like. Uh, doing water conservation, we can do a lot better than what we're doing now. We did save about over 20% last year. Um, we can do better than, than 20%. This gives you an idea of the water being used. Up here, look at the total down here. 45,000 acre feet of water is being used just by mostly cities. Santa Rosa's biggest is 17,000. Pinaluma, second largest at close to 8,000 acre feet of water per year. To look at this number. I want you to remember this number, 46,000 acre feet per year used mostly by people, a little bit of irrigation, but mostly by the people uh, with access to the Russian River water. Because that matters. And when you're looking at the total uh, Lake Sonoma, oh, it rains 23 inches. Oh, we're saying, no, we're not saved by 23 inches of rain this year. We're still lower than we've ever been before in the last 10, 15 years in our water supply right now, even with all the rain that we've just had. So, um, Notice this graph, this is at the beginning of October, the rainy season, water comes in, rain comes in, uh, usually much more in the past, this year not as much because the water soaked into the ground, went into groundwater, not into the surface water, into the reservoir. And so groundwater moves a lot slower uh, through the ground to fill up the, the reservoir. So we haven't had that much fill up this, this year and we're declining and look at the rate of decline. It's pretty similar out here, rate of decline so uh, in prior years, let's say, uh, let's take this line right here, this last year line right in here. We started right here at about uh, 180,000 acre feet, and we ended up with about 110 um, acre feet. So that's, we dropped 70,000 acre feet in one year, even with the little bit of rain, 10 inches of rain that we had last year. So you look at that, what we're doing now, and, and the starting point is lower, we're going to head on down here. We're going to be down right about here when we're done by the end of the summer. Um, and gee, we need 45,000 acre feet for people. And people are not the biggest users. The fish actually are legally allowed and are given more water than people right now. And they did reduce the water down. Uh, they cut that like 50% last year um, uh, because of concerns for saving water. So good thing they did that last year because this year we're going to need the water. Um, so they've reduced the water for the fish uh, tremendously last year, and we'll probably do that again. But uh, but normally we would normally give the fish more water than we do, and then there's a little bit of agricultural use that we also have here that our river goes to. Besides ground, mostly it's go to groundwater is used in agriculture, but some of our river water is used. So but our urban areas that means we only have one and a half years of water in our reservoir that feeds everybody. And if we only have a one and a half year stock of water and we have a five year drought, we're in big trouble. So we need to do a better job of conservation um, from here on out. Even if we get luxurious water in the, in the future, we need to make sure that we stay up here up high and we have four to five years of water in our lake um, at, as much as possible. So I think they are talking about how to increase the reservoirs um, and maybe even 
possibly adding more small reservoirs around, um, but we have to worry about the fish also. So these are all complex, complex issues, but we're in trouble this year. We are in trouble. Please conserve water now. Okay, we have some positive things. Uh, we do have a historic downtown. We have, we have a, a more degrees here in Petaluma than any other town in Sonoma County. Uh, because we are uh, basically a commuter town that goes down to the San Francisco and other areas. But we're also very progressive and forward thinking. And that's what's happening right now in the GPAC. We have a very green agenda in the general plan advisory committee, moving things forward tremendously in that direction. The, the city staff is very, is dwindled down, but is very, very dedicated. They do more than 40 hours a week, every single one of them. And I've seen them just work really hard and do the best they can for us. And they're all dedicated, everyone I've talked to and worked with. Um, we have lots of programs here. Uh, we do have a stable economic base. We, were, we have a telecom valley here. Uh, it was bigger, it's a little smaller, but it's growing still. We're close to San Francisco. We have good economics here uh, just to keep our city strong. We do have an urban boundary. Back in the 70s, we, we actually won a Supreme Court case to keep our urban growth boundary. And we have managed growth systems in place and we wanna even do a better job of, of managing our growth um, from this point forward. So yeah, the city's very aware of this and the general plan right now is saying, yeah, we do need to do a better job management. We have a unique watershed. It's independent and we need to work with the county. The county controls most of the watershed, but uh, uh, we need to work with county on it. Okay, we have, um, there's an area I'm showing in a map of the, from the city. This is where the green, this is where we need to do work in greening the urban, right along the river and the, and the highway. We lost 900 trees, redwood trees this last year. <clears throat> There's lots of issues around the Russian River, around groundwater, flood, drought. We well, need to save wetlands. We need, uh, they're channelizing our waters. We need to put in more catchment basins, slow our water down, going down, catch the sediment, catch the water uh, so it doesn't fill up our, our, um, uh, our slough river. Uh, we've had a lot of trees being removed uh, in the past and, and currently what's going on now, a lot of folks are getting scared with, of tree limbs falling and the like. A lot of the redwood trees planting in the 70s, they're going, oh, uh, we're worried. So a lot, a lot of folks are, are cutting down trees right now. We have to uh, work on that. Sea level rise is coming three feet within this century, but people need to talk about the next century. It's next century, it's 10 feet, unavoidable, it's coming. The modelers have said, the scientists have said, we have 10 feet of sea level rise coming in the next 150 years. Are we gonna plan for it or not? We're all talking about this three foot level rise. No, it's not three foot, it's 10 foot. And uh, so we're talking about saving everything for the three foot for the next 50 to 100 years, but that's not the end. And we cannot, even everything we do now, we cannot stop it. It's gonna be 10 foot level rise in 150 years. Um, so there are forces out of our control that we need to manage, including all the immigration that's moving around. Lots of uh, folks with money are moving up here. They love our town. A lot of uh, folks from the tech industry are, oh, lovely, let's, let's retire down here, sell our $1.5 million home and buy another $1 million home up here. And a lot of folks are moving in. Um, and also we have lots of uh, notes in the schools. There's a lot of immigration from the Hispanic community coming up that people don't realize 50% of our public school population is getting close to Hispanic right now. And that's another thing that uh, we're not recording properly and making folks aware. So our population is shifting. Um, tremendously over the next 50 years. Um, we have conflicting mandates between growth and conserving water and a lot of argument going on right now around that. Okay, we have flooding is normal here in Sacramento back in 1980, uh, 1860, I should say. Here's a picture of what Sacramento looked like uh, for a little while. Flooding, every few years we flood, 2005, the outlet mall completely flooded over. We put the, uh, the Denman Reach, uh, or not the Denman, uh, the Peyran, reach area that brown paper we put basically a reservoir widened it out and built it out and, and worked on it um, and also the denman reach we've put in some basins in here recently if anybody's walked out there the denman reach is just north um, uh, over there by the um the cars out here if you go industrial drive you can go walk there it's a nice little path there's a video i just did that's showing this that's on uh, our website penalma wetlands alliance and then this is an area right now of, this is where we need to do work for flood management. We need to do management of flooding and sediment and all these areas in the upper river area. Here's the past, just uh, eight, 18,000 years ago, this was all land. And this was just tiny little river up here. These were rivers and valleys. And this was all land all the way up to the Fairlands, 18,000. 5,000 years ago, 
things changed, sea level rise happened. Uh, we, have, we had an interglacial area, so we filled up with water. Here's what it looked like 5,000 years ago, or three to 5,000 years ago. And then after 150 years ago, this is what it looked like still 150 years ago. And then we came in and now what, this is what it looks like now, just in 150 years. We've pretty much filled a lot of stuff in, diked, uh, did all sorts of things to re remove um, the water around the bay, put in our cities, uh, put on waste, put everything there. And sea level rise, even the three foot that's gonna happen is gonna change it to this. And, and the 10 foot's even gonna do uh, about the same, gonna bring it back to what it was historically, even with all the land that we've uh, filled in it there. Then up here, just showing sea level rise, a three foot rise. This is what it's gonna look like when we have a three foot rise. This will become part of the ocean and, um, and look like mud flat pretty much all the way up, up throughout our entire marshlands. If we don't do anything now, to try to do conservation methods. And a downtown area, this is just sea, not even flooding, just sea level rise um, with a three to four foot rise. This is, so some of the areas of our town up here will be flooded just from sea level rise, not rainstorms. And this is usually in combination with just a, a major rain, not a, not a few flooding rain. So we need to worry about that. Uh, here's a FEMA flood map showing that if we do have major ones uh, with minimum sea level rise, two to three feet of sea level rise, um, in combination with our uh, heavy rainstorms that we may be getting, all these areas will be flooded um, if we don't do something. And we, there's things we can do to keep this minimized um, and, and learn to live with, with potential flooding. Here's just a closer, closer map. This is from a flood factor uh, folks who do a global effort. Uh, not just FEMA, which is the US space, but the flood factor folks do it globally. And I think they do a little better job of defining a little bit more elevation changes and how it's being influenced um, uh, by potential flooding. So this just shows you a little better map of the downtown area, uh, actually the river area in here. So this is the outlet mall right here, right there. And here's our, our another section of town I'm gonna talk about. We have uh, wildfires, we need to be considered that. But usually we're safer than most of the towns. We have um, really nice grasslands around us mostly. And we have nice, beautiful buffer that the fires can be managed. Uh, we have a little bit here on the other side of town that's a little bit more forested, uh, a little bit maybe drier that may uh, be a little bit more hazardous. But for the most part, um, uh, we have compared to other cities, we are in much better shape for, for wildfire protection than most because we have a zone, uh, urban boundaries with agriculture all around us. Here's just, there's pockets around town that, that do have some uh, fire potential, but the fire department knows about these and uh, how it spread, um, has everything modeled and mapped, so they're on top of it. We have traditional solutions that have been used. Uh, the water agency is, is planning ahead. Uh, we have um, the leader of the water agency now came out of uh, Save the Bay, uh, that's uh, Grant Davis, and so and he agreed to to join with the water agency years ago. He told me, um, he told them, I'm going to be green, and I'm going to push green agenda th throughout. And that's actually why they hired him to to lead that agency from outside to come in and hopefully change the way things are done. And so I think we're going to have good leadership with water agency to, moving us forward on this. So we need to be grateful for that. The um, Groundwater Sustainable uh, Agency is, is working on it. They're looking at a 50 year plan, which we're working on, which I'm part of right now. GPAC is going forward with 20 year plan. The county is also changing the way it's talking about water and wildlife and oak trees and um, how to manage everything. So it, things are, we're in transition, it's great. We have SF Bay, um, the entire Bay Area, just a new regional, um, community has joined together, formed a new organization that's looking at the entire Bay. Everybody's going to sign in to have a whole Bay Area master plan is in development right now. So good things are happening. Um, recycled water desalination. Can we get it? It's extremely expensive, very high energy use. We don't want to go there if we don't have to, but if a couple of folks have gone there uh, down in San Diego and other places, uh, Monterey, uh, they need it there. But it's a very, very expensive if we got to go that, that way. And it's, it's a last resort if we need to. We need to work on smart growth now, city boundaries and the like. That's all being worked on. And then flood channels. OK, this is the whole Bay Area. Lots of work is being planned throughout the entire Bay Area to true conservation work to protect us against the sea level rise. So we're working on it. These are all the different things that are going on here, pictures. 
down here, we have had dredging. Um, $10 million last time. If we do it on a five-year basis, it's four to $5 million every four to five years or $10 million every uh, 15 to 20 years. Um, this is what dredging does. This is what the Solenberg looked like filled with water uh, from a drone uh, airplane shot. And this is all the trash. We've, this is one day's work out of 14 that we pulled trash out of the dredge spoils there. Lots and lots of trash is ending up in our river. And talking about our wetlands, huge complex wetlands have more carbon cycling going on than even the rainforest or just equal to the rainforest because it's a complex system. We have salt water coming in and out, different layers are coming in and out. We have tides coming up and down, changing the landscape tremendously. We have biophysical chemistry going on that's very complex and interacting with each other. And it's, it's a stable system. If, it, if it's a healthy, stable, robust system. We have a food web that's huge that's going on in our wetlands. People don't realize, oh, it's pretty stable, doesn't do anything. No, we have a huge complex system out here and one of the nicest wetlands, marshes along the entire west coast of the United States and Canada. So we need to really work on preserving it. It's at risk. You see behind me is, is, uh, is a mud flats of uh, Gray's Marsh that's looking over from Schollenberger. Our entire marsh will look like that if we don't do anything now. So what do we need to do? We need to change some of the dike systems from large dikes holding the water back to smaller dikes further back with a little bit more gradual in front of it for tidal protections. And this will be long-term better maintenance and longer protections from sea level rise. So moving large ones back and making them smaller uh, is gonna be a good thing. The way we manage our waters and, and the processes and look at restoration types works. A lot of folks are working on that. Sonoma Land Trust is working at Sears Point. Um, there's another concept where we have long, long, gradual marshland in here leading up to the dikes. So we're filling in and using sediment. We can fill in and create various dike systems and also change maybe some of the elevations in here using the dredge poles in small areas where, where it's most critical. Um, and then we can change the way um, how we're going to be impacted by sea level rise. So we can modify things a little bit over time um, versus using sediments uh, in various ways. So using dredge spoils to save our marsh uh, would be a good thing. But there's nature-based solutions that we can use. So buying and managing the, all our green space, using retention basins along our creeks and up, up river. We need to build a lot of those. Uh, removing lawns and putting in um, uh, trees because trees absorb water. They absorb lots and lots of water. A third of their weight can be water. So lots of trees absorb lots of water uh, preventing flooding. Uh, using native trees for biodiversity, because uh, that's, uh, that's where the insects live and where the birds feed on the insects. Um, dredging sediments, reshaping things, uh, better water management, repairing habitat, creek restoration, uh, making sure we maintain our green belt around our town, increasing our wildlife corridors. And one thing right now what you support on is the river park and the area around the outlet mall. Right now the whole floodplain, can we save and preserve it? And I think there's two things going on there. Here's the river park. I fully support the folks that have bought this land are gonna, and on a, we're gonna go slow. They perfectly gonna plan to go community, create a beautiful park area for us, ecologically based uh, with some uh, art sculptures in place also, combination of wildlife and people interacting together. So lots of opportunity here down the road. It's gonna take about another $15 million to make that happen. The other area that I'm looking at now is also this river. Here's the river, here's the outlet mall going right on through. We wanna save and conserve this river. Um, there's access paths that's already 20 years ago. We said, we need to have access and paths around here. People can visit it, make it into a park area all the way up and down. And we have to be careful about whatever we do here with these lands, they're wetlands, they're gonna flood. This whole area in here floods. So we need to manage that and change the way we have that right now. Right now it's supposed to be all developed, 100% developed. Is, is, that's what's on the books. We need to change that. And hopefully we will. Okay, there's areas. Uh, these, are what, these are plans that have already been put together with the San Francisco Estuary Institute said, hey, this is what we can do. Here's a map of all the, the areas we can uh, prevent sediment from coming down, do some flood management up in the river, change some of the way we deal with our wetlands, buy the land, turn it into wetlands. So change the agriculture back into wetlands or to move the dikes back somehow, but re reinstate the original river as much as possible and, and, and manage our lands here. 
all possible to do that. It's gonna take a lot of effort, a lot of money. Um, I'm also working with Relief, um, and then we're planting as many native trees as we can all over town, starting with all the gray water, uh, or I should say purple pipe water in all the parks. We just did 150 trees at Weissman. We have grant for another two more parks, and we've been asked to uh, reapply for more money because they have a little bit of money in California Relief to give us. So we've reapplied for another grant. And so maybe we can do four or five parks now on where, wherever we can put the purple pipe water, which is recycled water. Um, water conservation at home. I, I did that last year and uh, I was able to get it down to a 550 cubic feet within a month, which is under the standard that's set for Healdsburg. Healdsburg said 75 gallons per person per day. They actually had that limit last year. Two people talked to me. I, I, um, and they said oh, they're extremely proud. They got down to 25 gallons per day per person in their household with the two of them in their house uh, is what they were doing. And they said they did the extremes but they got it down that far to demonstrate it could be done. And this is 600 cubic feet. So look at your water bill, look at your cubic feet. You need to get down to, to 600 cubic feet uh, per month on average and, and, um, and even less in the wintertime, uh, maybe a little bit more in the summertime, but we need to average less than 600 cubic feet per month usage. Water is very cheap, four cents per gallon is all you pay for your water here uh, directly uh, for fresh water coming out of your tap. So they've made water as cheap as possible so that everybody has easy access, affordable water as a resource. That was established long, long ago throughout the entire United States. They said, we are going to have cheap water as much as possible uh, for everybody and basically free. And, and so that way, and if it's free, gee, why conserve it? It's free, ah, no cost to me. It can't be about the cost. I put, in a, 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 I put in a rain catchment system, 500 gallons, cost me $800. So I'm never going to recoup that money, but I will have water, 500 gallons to help me through on, on, uh, on, in my garden. And that's also for earthquakes. So if earthquake happens, I'm going to have 300 gallons of water waiting for me um, to use if an earthquake happens and water's cut off. Okay, so we need to do a better job of conservation. And we need to save water at home. Lots of things we can do. There's an instrument called the Flume 2. You can buy over at uh, um, either online or at Friedman's, I think has got it. And it's a little instrument, you put it on your water meter and you can check out and, and look for your leaks. You can actually, it'll tell you a little bit where your leaks might be happening, when they're happening, how they're happening. And you can invest, I had someone do that and they cut their water in half. They actually cut, cut the water all the way in half just by applying this $200 instrument. And that's gonna save them $200 per month because they were using so much water in their pool, they were leaking water here and there and realized, oh, we fixed all, and we're gonna fix our leaks, and gee. So uh, there's an instrument you can attach to your water meter that works. Um, we have changed the way, no car washing, no fountains, no hot tubs, cover your pool, do sweeping. Uh, use, I put in a low flush toilets, they work really well. In fact, they're better operating than, than my old toilets. They, they flush better. Um, flow flower sheds, I collect water when I, before I shower and we use it in our, our toilets and also in our landscapes. Um, sink water, I filtered water and, and conserve on that. So it's just directly used just for drinking. Full laundry, uh, two minute showers, cutting a shower off and on. Um, hey, the two minute, um, what's called the marine shower, two minutes is all you really need. Uh, turns out most people on average are taking 20 to 25 to 30 minute showers, especially teenagers on average are taking 25 minute showers. And we need to say, hey guys, <laughs> uh, uh, cut that out. Get down to two minutes if you can. Um, uh, catching your rain off the roof, slow it, sink it, rain gardens, save water, save trees are important. So if you are gonna water anything in the landscape, please water your trees, save your trees, they're most important. Not your lawn, not your uh, little shrubs, they can be replaced easily. Save your trees, they're also carbon sequesters. And see, and then the coming down, um, there's the Cool Cities Challenge. Gee, uh, you've already heard about that, so I won't go on. You already got a good presentation on that, but they, these things you can join and be together. 